Welcome to the World War I History Podcast, produced by the MacArthur Memorial. We invite you to follow us on Twitter at MacArthur1880 or find the General Douglas MacArthur Memorial on Facebook. This podcast was sponsored by the Ernst and Gertrude Tico Charitable Foundation. We have wanted to cover World War I poetry on the World War I podcast for a long time. Future podcasts will discuss some of the more well-known poets, but today we have an opportunity to explore some of the forgotten voices of the period while delving deeper into how this poetry helps us understand the complexity of the experience of the war and why it has such resonance. We are joined today by two subject matter experts, Dr. Connie Rusick, professor of English at Robert Morris University and editor of International Poetry of the First World War, an Anthology of Lost Voices, and Dr. Jennifer orth Bayon, professor at Georgia Tech at Mez France, editor of Beyond Their Limits of Longing, Contemporary Writers and Veterans on the Lingering Stories of World War I. Welcome, ladies, and thank you for joining us. So there's a perception today that poetry is a very elite medium. Dr. Ruzik, what role did poetry play in late 19th and early 20th century? And why is understanding that so crucial to understanding the experience of World War I? Thanks so much for having me. I, that's a great question. And it's really important because poetry held a really different place in society than it does today. It was popular. It was written for and by nearly everyone. It was a way of understanding or commenting on human psychology or controversial social issues and current events. It was also a, really a regular feature of leisure and entertainment. There were funny poems, sentimental poems, love poems. We have to remember that this was a world without radio or television, and the silent film industry was really just beginning. I think today we all think of poetry uh, much narrower in its reach. It's largely studied at school, not often liked very well. It's analyzed. It's difficult. But in the early years of um, the 1900s, poetry was a regular feature in newspapers. It often appeared actually on editorial pages where people wanted to make arguments. But poems also commonly appeared in songbooks or in comic books, believe it or not, in nature field guides it was in advertising, it was in propaganda, and people would see poems printed on calendars and breath mint tins, menus and milk bottles, thermometers, candy boxes, business cards, even bird food. So in the United States, just about anyone might consider himself or herself fit to write poetry, and even really called upon to write it. And if you didn't write it yourself, you were highly likely to find poems that you did like. Remember, it was everywhere. And you would hand copy them or you would cut and paste your favorites into a scrapbook so you could make your own personal poetry collection that you could bring to gatherings, you could share it with friends, or you could just read it on your own. And therefore, it's really no surprise that when the First World War broke out, people responded with poetry. They wrote in support of the war or they wrote against the war or they simply described the ways in which the world seems to have really suddenly shifted. So in England, for example, the London Times, just one of the many British newspapers, received as many as 100 war poems a day during August of 1914. And in Germany, it's estimated that at least 50,000 war poems were written every day during the first month of the war. In America, um, the most widely read column of the military newspaper, The Stars and Stripes, was the Army's Poets. And in 1918, over 18,000 poems were submitted to that paper. So for anyone who wishes to read short, powerful, firsthand accounts of the First World War, I would encourage them to explore the poetry that was published during the war. Poems with titles such as New Year's Wishes to the German Army, or Song of the Mud, or On the Death of Bingo, Our Trench Dog. I always think of anthologies like exhibits. And in museums, we make judgments about what artifacts we present, what images we present. And we have a purpose. We have a story we want to tell. So you point out that anthologies have agendas too. So what agendas have shaped the canon of World War I poetry and the voices present in that canon? Poetry anthologies do have agendas. And, and what I mean by that simply is that editors always select specific works to tell a certain story or to argue for a perspective or a viewpoint. And I think that's even more true in collections of war poetry. Editors choose poems that shape readers' views of the war and, the, and that shape their influences and their reactions to the conflict. So if we think about First World War poetries published during the war, 
They weren't all alike. They had a variety of aims, but many collections wanted to share poems that would be, and I'm quoting here, from an anthology. They said they were giving people poems that would be psychologically interesting as sincere transcripts of personal experience. That means that that anthology tried to offer accounts you couldn't get in a paper. It would help you understand what war was like for your son or your brother in the trenches. What was he thinking or feeling? It would help you think what was war like for civilians who were living in war zones or for those working in munition factories or those who lived in areas that were bombed by zeppelins. Other anthologies had the aim of really supporting the war and morale, and those were aimed at readers who wished to be inspired or comforted. With those, um, poems were chosen to reassure people that the cause their country was fighting for was worth the death and the mutilation of millions. And as the war went on, many readers wanted poetry to reassure them that God was with them in their suffering and that there was hope after this life for those who have died. That's all happening during the war. But 10 years after the end of the war and the armistice of 1918, war poetry collections were changing. Instead of including poems written by both men and women, as the earlier anthologies had, soldiers and civilians, Instead, the anthologists of the late 1920s began to select only poems written by soldiers at the front, and only poems that protested the First World War and commented on its futility. And nearly all of those poems would give you narratives of disillusionment or alienation. And that's when we see this figure of the archetypal war poet as a battle-traumatized soldier emerging, and he's writing in protest of the war. And the first anthology that really does that is one published in 1930 by Frederick Brereton called An Anthology of War Poems. I have to just say, I found this um, in December at a secondhand bookshop for $10 and almost died on the spot. Um, so I was really happy to get it. It's, an un it's a rare anthology now. But when you think of what that was published in 1930, the Great Depression had just happened. You had the rise of the Nazi party in Germany. Many were fearing that a second world war was imminent. And so that voice of soldier poets who protested the previous war was very compelling. And since 1930, and particularly over the last 50 years, the commemoration of the First World War, the 50th year commemoration occurred during the Vietnam War. Those poetry anthologies have centered their collection upon the same writers, often the same poems. They're those written by British soldiers who were poets, Wilfred Owen, Siegfried Sassoon, Rupert Brooke, Edward Thomas, Ivor Gurney, Isaac Rosenberg, Edmund Blunden, Robert Graves, David Jones. That may seem like a lot of names, but really, that's about it. It's their poetry. It's limited to that. And to a great extent, it's been assumed that the best war poetry... Some would argue the only war poetry was written by soldiers on the Western Front, most of whom were British. The poets we now identify as those canonical war poets, particularly Owen and Sassoon, were actually rarely included in anthologies published during the war. Owen only had five poems published in his lifetime. One of those publications was even in a hospital magazine, not widely seen. Uh, his most famous poem wasn't published until after the war and after his death. The First World War poetry that most people are likely re to read today has a much narrower range of authors, of settings, of subjects, of perspectives, attitudes, and tones than poetry that was published and read during the war. Tell us about the anthology you edited. What voices does that add? Well, my anthology, um, International Poetry of the First World War, attempts to recover that wider range of war poetry, focusing on pub poems that were published and popular during the war. That poetry is often much more accessible than canonical poetry or poetry and studied in school because it wasn't written to be studied, to be analyzed, to write papers about. It was written to express immediate reactions to current events and to share personal reactions to the war. Specifically, I included authors from around the world, not just British soldier poets. It's important, I think, to remember when we think of the poetry of the war that this was a world war. So my anthology includes poems from Austro-Hungary, Belgium, Canada, France, Germany, India, Ireland, Italy, New Zealand, Russia, South Africa, and the United States. And then I also deliberately included a variety of perspectives on the war. So there are poems written in support of the war and poems in protest against it. Poems that were written to recruit troops for the army and then propagandist poems that assure readers that their country has the moral high ground. Poems written by conscientious objectors who protested the war, by pacifists. Poems written by soldiers who realistically will describe the sufferings of the war, but who are writing out of the sincere belief that the cause they were fighting for was worth all of the suffering. And finally, I included the voice of civilians and non-combatants, which featured so prominently in the poetry published during the war. 
both those on the home front and those writing from the war zone, which actually extended far beyond the trenches to include ruined villages, hospitals, bombed cities, uh, as well as the war at sea and in the air. Because that is such different context, I included after each poem a really short, brief essay that attempts to provide helpful context. It might give descriptions of world events or of weapons or war tactics or author biographies, reviews, and early critical reception. I re really have tried to highlight the um, connections between history and poetry because I believe that those connections provide greater insight into the attitudes, expressions, and lives of those who lived during the war. Are there any particular voices that you'd like to highlight today? Oh, thanks for that question. I really would. The poetry written by soldiers, which is best known now, is rich and very powerful, and I'm not trying to supplant that. What I would like to add and highlight poetry written by civilians and non-combatants. It's estimated between 6.5 and 7 million civilians died as a result of the war. And while many people know that nearly 20,000 British soldiers were killed on the first day of the Battle of the Somme, Few people realize that nearly twice as many Serbian civilians were killed as compared to Serbian soldiers, or that an estimated 750,000 German civilians died as a result of the Allied naval blockade. And those numbers are just dwarfed by civilian deaths in Africa or Russia, Poland, Lithuanian, and the Ottoman Empire. It's important to realize that the world's first total war really resonates in unsettling ways with current wars being fought in the Middle East and Ukraine. So with that background, I'd really like to share some brief excerpts of poems written by civilians. And the first excerpt is from a poem by a German writer, Maria Benemann. She uses her German soldier husband's letters and pieces them together and what she has learned from him to write a poem titled Visse, After a Letter from the Field. The poem's setting is the German army's invasion of Belgium in 1914 and the German attack on the city of Visse, where German troops executed Belgian silk. Belgian civilians in reprisal for the deaths of German soldiers who had been killed by Belgian snipers. She writes from the perspective of her soldier husband. He's entered this elegant home. He is searching for snipers and he has found a piano. And the poem concludes with this stanza. Then set fresh flames. You do your duty. You blow this house up like all the rest. Was that a cry or just a broken string? Music, music behind you has collapsed. The second excerpt I'd like to share is from a poem written by a British author, Margaret Sackville. It's titled A Memory, and she is describing what life is like for civilians who are living near the front lines. And that poem simply begins, there was no sound at all, no crying in the village, nothing you would count as sound, that is, after the shells, only behind a wall, the low sobbing of women the creaking of a door, a lost dog, nothing else. And then from her poem, September 1918, the American writer, Amy Lowell, writes of the anxiety and exhaustion that so many have felt living in war, a world that has been at war for years. And I love her lines, I have time for nothing but the endeavor to balance myself upon a broken world. Finally, I'd like to highlight an excerpt from Alice Dunbar Nelson's poem, I Sit and Sew. This poem now and then is um, studied in school, but never with its background. This poem is responding to a specific U.S. government policy of the First World War that refused the volunteer service of African-American nurses. The U.S. government argued that they would not send them overseas as, quote, there are no separate quarters for them, and it is not deemed advisable to assign white and colored nurses to the same post. So Dunbar Nelson's poem is describing the frustration um, and worry of the African-American community as it pictures black soldiers who are wounded by flamethrowers and shell fire and who will die because white nurses will refuse to touch them or care for them. The poem, uh, this short excerpt are these lines. I sit and sew. My heart aches with desire. Pageant terrible, that fiercely pouring fire on wasted fields and writhing grotesque things once men. My soul in pity flings appealing cries, yearning only to go there in that holocaust of hell, those fields of woe. But I must sit and sew. I'd, I'd like to argue that the attitudes and ideas held by civilians are exceptionally important because, as one scholar has argued, the home front is important even perhaps more important than the battlefield, because it's on the home front that cultural energies, political imperatives, social needs, psychological desires and fears 
even military necessities, those things needed to go to war and stay there. It's on the home front that they're defined and maintained. Thanks for letting me share those. Wow. Some pretty powerful ones there. Thank you very much, Dr. Rusick. Dr. Orfeon, now you have done a lot of work with veterans. Why do you think World War I has so much resonance with them? And why not a different conflict? Why not the Vietnam War? Why not something closer in our memory? Well, that's a really good question because it does seem we we have been in a lot of wars. So why World War I, a war that happened over 100 years ago? But before I answer that particular question, um, I think I want to, in my anthology, was the anthology that I constructed. Uh, it was born out of a project that I, in a class I taught at Georgia Tech in Atlanta, where I taught the literature of war memoirs, but also included poetry as, part, as sort of a way of thinking through memoir. And I was able to invite some of the writers uh, who were writing about contemporary wars at the time to talk to my class. And I noticed a pattern that when they were asked what their influences were, they all we, why they started wanting to write about their experience, they all referenced World War I and most importantly, World War I poetry. And so I, that idea was really what inspired me to, to put together this anthology, which started as a blog, like Connie's book also started as a blog asking uh, veterans to write about the influence of World War I on their own writing or their own th- or the w- way that they reflect upon their own experience in war. And so I want to say that the veterans that participated in my anthology, um, I just want to say the diversity of veterans and how that they all said this about World War I. So I have American veterans who were in the Vietnam War, the Gulf War, the Bosnian War, the Kosovo War, the Iraq War, the Afghanistan War, conflicts in Israel and Lebanon, uh, Libyan conflicts, I also have people who, veterans who contributed to the anthology from different countries other than the United States, Canadians, Israeli, really, sorry, uh, Scottish, Irish, and also a diversity of groups. Uh, for example, we had veterans cont- uh, contributing from a lot of women veterans, uh, women who were in World War I, not just as nurses, but also there were some that were, were fighters. We have people from the LGBTQI plus community, African-Americans, uh, Native Americans, Iraqis, Asian Americans. So that's just to show that all of these, a lot of these writers, that all of them said very similar things and they all had very similar references to what they thought of as World War I literature and poetry. And they weren't at all what, what Connie, as Connie said, they weren't at all what Connie was talking about. These were mostly the very canonical poets that are t- that is taught or taught in in high schools. So it's another thing to it's sort of also ter- important to remember that the the veterans that I that wrote for my anthology are writers. They have decided to become writers to put their. It's not something just like free writing about their experience, which is also. an excellent way to think through war experience. But these are writers who are committed to putting their experience into a form. After especially current contemporary wars of Iraq and Afghanistan, there was a large movement in the United States to help veterans write about their experiences, but also help them put these experiences in very polished formats. I mean, veterans have won Pulitzer Prizes, Nobel Prizes, so um, very, very prestigious awards for their war writing. Just want to name a couple of those uh, writing groups. For example, there was uh, Words After War, the Veterans Writing Project, which was also huge. There were some online publications called the Wrathbearing Tree, Consequence Forum, the Line Literary Review, which is at Columbia University, War, Literature, and the Arts. So there is an effort to produce quite high quality literary work from these experiences by the, these veterans. Of course, when you want to sit down and put these uh, your ideas into format, what do you do? What does any writer do? They look to people who have done it before them. And the most accessible, I would say, the most uh, accessible that they writers that they encountered were these World War I poets. And that was for many reasons. Uh, one of the reasons was that it was the first probably war literature that they read in an English class at university. It's it's where it was passed down from other people. Say, oh, you have to, this is a canonical war, piece of works of war. And what I'm talking about, be, I'm going to talk about that, what that is specifically in just a second, is that these works that were very canonical, the works that Connie that doesn't talk about in her work were so accessible and so taught. They were part of a genre. The British modern war poets is basically a genre of poetry that's taught in 
in English classes in high schools in in, in universities. And so uh, we have this impression that that's that's the main representation of the war, which Connie is showing that it was much larger, but that's larger. But that's the stuff that got got into our school curriculums. And that's the most those are the most well-referenced poets. So both basically I'm talking about uh, Sigrid Sassoon, Bert Owen, Isaac Rosenberg. These poets are probably the most cited poets. There were there were also, for example, even the Sarah Teasdale is often cited as a canonical writer in many uh, ways. I know I read her and I read those. And that, when I think about World War One, I, I think about that at, when I was an English major. Uh, so that's what they have access to uh, at first. And these poems are representative of what which is called modernism, the movement of modernism, which we can define globally as a movement that tried to um, break with all past traditions, uh, not just in writing and literature and culture, but also to break with religion, with education, with other institutions that seemed to be fixed in stone in society. And this had to do a lot with the rapid progress society was undergoing at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, the industrial age, industrialization, uh, the rapid progress of society, which produced among, as these writers would say, a feeling of unease, a feeling of um, having their world's sort of changed so fast and this sort of sort of fragmented existence uh, and almost a pessimistic outlook on what the world was. And World War One came along and some people say because of it or in spite of it, uh, but whatever happened, World War One presented uh, the experience that the modernists were talking about, but you know, times 1,000 million million. Um, and so the war, it became a place where modernism fit really well because modernism played with narrative technique. It played with form. It played with language. And it basically allowed poetry to become this place of, of truth for the, for the war experience. And I also, also, also always like to quote the words of Eric Maria Remarque, who wrote All Claire on the Western Front. He says in the book that he goes home on a furlough to see his family and he can't find he can't use words to tell them about the experience because he says, if I if I use words, that's going to make them assume that I understand what I'm doing in this war. But I don't really understand what I'm doing. It's it's beyond me. And so for me to use words, especially traditional words, sacrifice or honor or glory, I would, it would seem that I understand it. So that's why I can't use those words because I haven't mastered the own experience. It's it's something so much beyond me, such such at the limits of human of human experience, right? So poetry, uh, a place where you can play with language, you can play with form, you can play with style. That becomes a place where you can put that feeling, right? The feeling that you that you have trouble expressing by perhaps referencing something else. I know one of the writers of my book, a veteran, I'm Brian Kastner, did an interview with another writer, and he said that what he admired about Sigrid Sassoon's poetry is that. Uh, war was not found in the traditional places you'd find war. War was not found in the guns or the bombs. It was found in flowers, poppies coming up from the trenches. Uh, and that's, that, that contains something essential about war, that nothing that a bomb or, or the words that we wanted to use could. So all of that came together. So that's why the, these all of these veterans often reference these particular poets. And that the, as Aunt Connie said, that the they have been put in the canon. They but as she also said, they do not represent the fullness of the experience. But I think it is also interest to, interesting to see the, how much and how clearly these poets speak to so many of these veterans at the same time. I, so that's why I think the, World War One is the conflict that is the one that, that that's why they reached that conflict. And also it was in, in because it was the largest conflict as well. Right. And it was probably the conflict that produced the most amount of poetry, not just the poetry that Connie talked about, but also this movement. And it was cultivated in like, for example, Wilfred Owen and Sigrid Sassoon. They were in this hospital recovering together, a Craig Lock, Lockhart, and they they talked, they spoke, they they cultivated each other's poetry. Uh, they they thought about how this poetry was to be written. So it was really a very conscien conscious move on their part to write in this way and to encourage others to write in this way about war. Well, I think you've already really touched on this, but how do the veterans that you've worked with then use the literature of World War I to explore and then write about their own experiences? Well, I think one of the things that the, just to have with the, with the veterans had I found when I was talking to them, they, they were talking about the influence of this work on the work of some of these poets on them, that basically what they say is what these poets show them, or it was the first piece of war literature they might have read, as I said. And what they saw is that poetry had the power to express a narrative that wasn't a narrative that was imposed on their experience, right? It wasn't a narrative that was imposed by news or media or history books. Poetry was a place for them 
to voice their own experience individually. So I think the debt that the war writers owe this poetry is not just to the service of World War One soldiers, but to the, to the unprecedented way that they wrote about the war. As I said, it was one of the first times in history that literature played such a larger role in unveiling a side of war that was not really shown to the reading public. Prior to this, a lot of the war poetry well wasn't really, as Connie said, it wasn't really produced to, to show a lot of people. Um, and also anything that was made public had a very sort of triumphant, triumphant narrative, a narrative of sacrifice, a, nar- a, na- a narrative of martyrs. Um, and this poetry allowed for a wider experience. And often the returning service members did express a traditional renewed sense of patriotism and pride following the Allied victory. Um, and they were proud of what they did, uh, but they still saw it as very romanticized. And the stories of bravery and sacrifice didn't seem to resonate with them completely. But the new way, way of writing gave way to a vision of war that, uh, that illuminated the absurdity, the horror, the crippling, long-lasting physical and psychological consequences of life afterwards. And so I think that this was why they, this is what they, 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 they latch on to. Are there any voices that you would like to highlight from your own work? It's hard to choose because they have so many great voices, but I wanted to highlight some of the poets that contributed and what they said about uh, World War I poetry and their own writing. Or, uh, for example, I highlighted Brian Kastner, who was a, a Iraq veteran, and he's written many, several books. And he talked about how in Sassoon, he realized that that was where, that was how we could write about war because war wasn't in the traditional things where war was. War was in the, right, the poppies, the trees. And so he talks about that in this, in my, in the essay about how how he was able to discover that through so soon that he could write about war by not just writing about the violence, but also writing about even sometimes the the beautiful aspects of it as well, that that was just as much as communicating something about war as the, the terrible aspects. Besides, I wanted to mention Amalia Flynn, who is a poet. She was in a building next to the World Trade Center when it was, um, when it was attacked. So she had that experience. And then she later on went on to marry someone who went into combat, into those, into the wars that followed. Um, and so she is writing from the point of view of a woman who had experienced this attack and has experienced, uh, had also had her husband go, go off to war. And so she wrote the Zone Rouge, uh, which was uh, an area that uh, talk, was something that we talk about in World War One. She talked about her own Zone Rouge, trying to identify places in the contemporary wars that resembled the Zone Rouge of World War One. Uh, and then the third person I want to highlight in poetry was, was kind of an improbable Entry. Her name is Falia Hassan, who is an Iraqi female poet, Iraqi poet, um, refugee from Iraq. And she just she basically talks about how when she looks at World War One poetry, she understands that, as Connie said in her her piece, she understood that to write a real real war poem, you have to have gone to war. She really emphasizes that. And uh, she nails that home in some of her her essays. Final thoughts. I think one of the things that's key and interesting about the First World War poetry, whether we're talking the canonical poets or those who uh, have been forgotten or those who are only known in their own countries and and have not been as um, frequently included in English translations, is the way in which this was a world war um, at a time in which all of the boundaries of war were becoming indistinct. So you have the first war in which uh, you have civilians bombed who aren't close to the lines, Zeppelin attacks and uh, plane attacks. You've got famine, you've got gas attacks. And um, I just wanted to highlight the international aspect of the First World War poetry, which has so often been lost in the way it's which it's taught in school. So that to look at poems and translation, I think is important. Um, Jennifer has hinted at some of that, but poems by uh, Giuseppe Ungaretti, an Italian who talks about being crouched all night long, close to one of our men butchered, or poems written um, by the French uh, poet Albert Paul Grenier, um, which is called War Song, which pictures Dame Death joyously dancing and juggling skulls. And that to gain a sense of a world war, I think it's important to look at world poetry and to not limit it to just the British soldiers. That's so interesting you say that because I didn't mention this because it's that she writes about a novel. But uh, Shannon Huffman Polson, who was a veteran, uh, she wrote and she wrote contributed to my essay, uh, an essay about another experience. But she said that she was inspired to write about uh, the Italian front for my essay by Ungaretti's poetry. She begins her essay with a line from his poetry. 
So indeed, um, my the, the anthology that I have is a lot I mean, talks about those influences, but it also does extend to talk about other poets um, that were were equally as influential. And I think you're right. I think it's it's and I teach you teach it. I teach uh, modernism, and uh, I have to sort of really try to teach go beyond the canon. Modernism itself was an international movement. And so poems that came out of the war that reflected modernist sentiments were also coming from all over, uh, all over Europe, all over the world. One of the veterans in my book, Michael Carson, wrote about Viktor Shlovsky, who was also a Russian poet. Well, Dr. Rusik, Dr. Orthvayan, thank you very much for joining us today and sharing about World War I poetry and its resonance today. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you for listening. If you have questions, suggestions, or comments, we want to hear from you. You can find us on Twitter at MacArthur1880, on Facebook as the General Douglas MacArthur Memorial, or you can email MacArthurMemorial at Norfolk.gov.